So what do you have to do? You have to reinforce the door. Everybody pushes toward the back, so you need in, you need increased springs and reinforced axles. And finally, the third thing is that you could put a piece of metal in the socket and short out short out the um, truck the same way that if I put a, uh, something here, the fuse would blow. And how do we know this? Because after the mechanics designed this, they then sent an order to Renault, which was under German control, on how to build these trucks so they could work effectively. I came uh, last week and brought my uh, group to a place called Belgitz. Belgitz let me again give you statistics. Belgians had 500,000 Jews killed in a 10-month period. All of the Jews of Galicia were killed in a 10-month period. They were killed by a staff of 104, and there were two known survivors. Think of that as a ratio, so there's not the sense that you have of Auschwitz of selection Everybody who arrived, with the exception of a motley crew of people who were needed for a time, of Jews who were needed for a time, jewelers, some carpenters, and then schleppers, who what we call Zunder Commando, who had to take out the bodies and put them into mass burial fields. 500,000 Jews, 10 months, two known survivors went to Treblinka. Treblinka had 925,000 Jews, a staff of 120, 30 Germans, 90 Ukrainians, 67 known survivors. Treblinka had a rebellion. Again, in Treblinka, if you do the math, the death ratio in Treblinka was 99.99 9.9%. An enormously effective element. What made Auschwitz unique was the following. Auschwitz had a double goal. Its goal was, and by the way, each of the, well, let me just say, each of the camps had one other purpose which was very important. And some of you who work in, in organizations will have to understand this. There was no budget for these camps. They had to be profit centers. How do you make them profit centers? You make them profit centers by taking what the Jews brought with them and shipping it out. You also did something very basic, which is you took gold teeth out, you refashioned it and sent it to the Reich. You took human hair and you used it to create material and fabric. And they didn't make this, this what we call the soap myth. They didn't make soap out of Jews because the Jews did not have enough body fat to make it economically worthwhile. But they did use it to salt the roads and they did use it as excellent fertilizer and sold this as fertilizer in the process. The second way they did it was to create an entire industrial complex in which they leased labor to industry. They took the wages and the salary, and they gave, gave people the minimum needed, as it were, not even to survive, the minimum needed to work for a period of time. And in fact, we saw a, a very interesting um, you know, the gate of Auschwitz says, Arbit mach frei, work makes you free. And there was somebody who turned a piece of graffiti in one of the walls of the camp which says, Arbit mach tight, work makes you dead, which was the, don't believe it essentially. Let's use this for a moment as an example. You bring people to the camp, 
you drain all mineral usage from them because you don't give them enough to survive. And then essentially you recycle the human being into consumable raw material to be discarded in the process of manufacturing. Now to understand this, you have to understand where this differs from ordinary slavery. In ordinary slavery, and let's take the terror, and by the way, when I say it differs, that doesn't mean it, I don't want to make a judgment better or worse. I want to look at the structure of evil. American slavery, we had a slave market. Because the slave was considered a capital investment. If my Chevy could back up to your Volkswagen and produce a Mercedes, what would we do every night? We would have the slaves appropriate because they would produce more wealth. We also allowed for children to be born not to be free, not to have families, but why? Because they were valuable as future slaves. When you destroy a slave economy, it means you're going to enslave them forever until they die and they have no material value. And consequently, it's a, transforming the human being into a, cons a consumable raw material to be discarded by manufacture, by in the process of manufacture and recycled. It's the reduction of the human being into something of zero value. If we speak of the consecration of human dignity, this is desecration of human dignity. So Auschwitz represents the apex of this because the camps are united. If you arrive, you have selection. And when you have selection, if you're young and able-bodied, you work until you're no longer young and able-bodied because you've aged dramatically. Then you're recycled into the gas chambers and the like. So we have to say that this is the rationalization of not only the killing process, but the rationalization of the, the degradation of human beings into the worst form of degradation. That's the reason that Auschwitz becomes the apex, the symbol, as it were, the capital of evil. And it's the reason why when you think of the Holocaust, the one word that one comes to your mind is what? Auschwitz, Auschwitz, Auschwitz. So in one sense, and we have to talk for a moment, I've spoken about the perpetrator. I want to talk a little bit for a moment about the victim. Let's talk for a moment about Jews, and I want to teach you one line by which you can understand the Jewish situation. Just because Jews were powerless does not mean that they were passive. There's a difference between being powerless and being passive. Let's give an early example. We're in a synagogue. Between 1933 and 1938, you know what the synagogue became in Germany? On Monday night it might become a concert hall, on Tuesday night it might be the Philharmonic, on Wednesday night it might be an opera, on Thursday night it might be a play. During the week it became a Jewish school. On Monday it became an immigration office, on Tuesday it was a welfare office. On Wednesday it was language school, and on Thursday it was a immigration office in which people got the possibility of going somewhere. And they, there's even a, a very humorous joke about that, which is a guy comes to it and he says, I could send you to Austria, but that's very far from here. And he says, I can't think of a better recommendation. <laughs> which is again how humorous sometimes save the Jews. On Shabbat, the synagogue ironically was a place where Jews gathered because it was the one place that they could be drawing strength from each other. And rabbis had to do a very interesting thing. Rabbis had to figure out how to say something without saying something. By the way, we have too many rabbis who say too much without saying anything, not yours. 
but they had to say something without saying something. So let's give you the example of the Yom Kippur prayer that Rabbi Leo Beck um, wrote, on, wrote for 1935. Rabbi Leo Beck paraphrases the Elenu, the adoration. He says, we bend our knees and we bow down before the, ki- the, with Neymeth, the King of the King of Kings, the Holy One, blessed be He. And then he adds, but we stand erect before man. Now everybody says we stand direct before man. Well, that sounds unusual. What's he telling us? Because there's a Gestapo agent in the back. Joachim Prince is no longer allowed to preach, so he takes a line that is the concluding line of the Amidah in the devotion after the Amidah. It says, all who think evilly of me, Mehera Hafera Tatam, overturned their advice in Kalkel Machshvotam and disturbed their thoughts, ruined their thoughts. He keeps the congregation repeating that in Hebrew. They don't know Hebrew that well, but what do they look at? They look at the German translation without showing the Gestapo agent what the German translation is. And all of a sudden, the prayer is saying what? What do we want to do with the enemies? Let me give you another example, which was a salvational example. You know how Danish Jews found out that they were going to be deported? The rabbi on the Shabbat before Rosh Hashanah gets up to his congregation, makes the announcements at the end of the services, and he says, the cantor and I have discovered that we didn't take enough of vacation, so services are canceled on Tuesday and Wednesday, and we're going to go to the sea. Mm-hmm. What the hell does that mean? The rabbi is canceling services for Rosh Hashanah. He and the cantor complaining they haven't had a vacation. They're under German occupation. Everybody then figures out what? The rabbi's not crazy. He can't mean what he says. If he's telling us he's going to the sea, we're nine miles away from Denmark, from Malmo. If he's going to the sea and he's canceling Rosh Hashanah services and he's not crazy, what is he telling us? And we say that, and what do we do, to, what do, we do when we come home? We call, do you know what the rabbi said today? Do you know what that probably means? How do you say something without saying something? So I want you to think of that, but I also want you to think that in the camps themselves, Jews developed, and this was a question of what did it take to survive? Every survivor tells you that it, um, they use a full letter word. Three of the letters are U-C-K, but the first is L, so I can say it in the synagogue. Every survivor tells you that they survived by luck but they also survived by certain skills, by a certain sense of what? Passion for life, and by being able to both assist each other and mutually support each other. They had a term in the camps, they used something called Muslim. Muslim were Muslims, is the word for Muslims, and why did they use Muslim? because the Muslims lie prostrate, pray prostrate. And nobody wanted to approach a Muslim man. That was a person who had given up all hope. And you were almost afraid that that would be catchy. And when we stood at Auschwitz this week, I told the people, you have double wired barbed wire, which were electrified. They had a turn going to the fence. 
And that meant that every day that you didn't go to the fence, you were deciding what? I'm, going to put, I'm not going to commit suicide today. And you're within 50 feet of going to the fence at any given point. And consequently, you needed a certain zest for life, and the more truthful also, you had to develop certain techniques. Food. You couldn't be first in line, you couldn't be last in line. Because they gave you um, a certain type of soup. If you're first in line, if you didn't lower the, the ladle down, you got nothing but water. If you were last in line, all of the dirt, because they didn't have any sanitary conditions, all of the dirt sunk to the very bottom and you were eating dirt. So you had to figure out where you wanted to be in line and try to figure that out. You had a bowl. The bowl you had to keep with you, guard it, with your life. Why? Because you needed the bowl to get your soup. If you lost your bowl, you died. Your bowl also ironically served as a place in which you would, uh, under certain circumstances, has to have to use it for defecation and urination and try to find a way to clean it out. And I just wrote the forward to a survivor's memoirs, and I said it was a uniquely honest memoir. Because the survivor spoke about his deep and profound friendship for Ernesto. So Ernesto and I did everything together. He kept me from going down to the bottom, and I kept him from going down to the bottom. We were friends. Women used the term camp sisters. And women, ironically, had a more, e a better sense of comradeship than men. He said, I'm fortunate that things did not reach the extreme where I would have stolen Ernesto's shoes. Because shoes were essential to survival. And in fact, there was something even called the Auschwitz walk which is, if you have very limited energy, if it gets muddy or it gets snowy, you only tread where somebody else has walked before, so you don't have to make the invitation and lift up the mud yourself. So you would walk like that. All of that was designed to conserve energy and to provide for survival. In three camps, there was resistance. Sobobor, Treblinka, Auschwitz itself blew up a crematoria. And then the question, which is the enormous miracle of modern Jewish history, is what happened the day after liberation. Liberation was bitter sweet. Sweet because no longer had an oppressor. Bitter because, as one survivor put it, in Auschwitz, if you cried, you died. So you couldn't allow yourself to feel. And the moment the oppression left go of you, you began to feel, and what did you feel? Loss, emptiness, despair. And then the question is, where do I go, what do I do? And then this is the story of the remarkable rebirth of the Jewish people. Let me give it to you in three short stories. I met a man in Boston by the name of Rabbi Arnold Weeder of blessed memory. Arnold Weeder was the um, mole of Boston. And because Boston has such a great love for the New York Yankees, he had the reputation in Boston his nickname was the Yankee Clipper. <laughs> with, all due with no apologies to Joe DiMaggio. I asked him one day, where did you learn to be a mole? He said, I learned to be a mole in Bergen-Belsen. In Bergen-Belsen, his father was a mole in Bergen-Belsen in 1946. If boys were born, he circumcised them. 
Now that's the most normal Jewish thing in the world. Why is it so abnormal in Bergen Belsen? Because for five years, if the Jewish man lowered his trousers, he was dead. On the sixth year, they dared to circumcise their sons without knowing where they would live, what they would do, what the world would be like. Bergen Belsen also had the highest birth ratio in all of Europe in the aftermath of World War II. The survivors responded to death by recreating life. And a child is the ultimate source of hope. One of the reasons we put every uh, boy on Elijah's chair is because we don't know what a kid's going to be. A child is what? A child is infinite hope. I know I'll no longer be the center fielder for the Brooklyn Dodgers or for the Los Angeles Dodgers, but any kid born could be anything. Right? I'm not going to be a ballerina either, but who knows what a little kid could be. Child is, the child is ultimate hope. They essentially brought children into the world and then they, they decided and made a very interesting decision, which has real implications for us. They decided to live as Jews. Not all of them. Think of Madeleine Albright's family. They had, and I taught with Madeleine Albright, so I knew her very well. I taught at Georgetown for 15 years. Madeleine Albright once described her parents as Czechoslovakian social democrats. And I said, they were Czech nationalists, they were Slovakian nationalists, the only Czechoslovakian nationalists were Jews. Social Democrats were Jews. She had Jewish cousins. It didn't dawn on her that she was Jewish. Why? Because being Jewish was the third rail of family story. And you know, in certain families, you don't talk about it. You don't what? You don't go near that. So not everybody decided to be a Jew, but they decided to rebuild the Jewish people. And some women essentially gave birth because they had lost menstruation during the Holocaust, because we now know that tension and starvation causes the cessation of menstruation. But many survivors will tell you the Germans put something in their food to cease that. And they wanted to see that they were women again, which the ultimate manifestation of that being young was to, be, was to bring life into the world. And essentially, they rebuilt and they were reborn. There's no reason why that had happened, except for the real ultimate existential decision. The world didn't deserve the Jews. And being Jewish in 1945, 46, 47 was the height of danger. Why would you take that on? But there was this incredible sense that we responded to death by life, and we responded to death in an incredible way by Jewish life. Israel is one ultimate manifestation of that, because essentially the Zionists had kept saying that essentially um, you weren't fully at home in Europe. And essentially, the only way Jews could become normal is to have a flag, a state, and an army. And in 1945, 46, 47, even to the anti-Zionists, that began to make sense. Now, we can argue whether Israel would, have, would, or, would or would not have been born without that. But it's clear that, and we can argue whether Israel was altruistic or as one person said it in a very interesting way, he said, every Jew who went to Palestine was one less Jew in Paris, Montreal, or New York. So don't assume the bigot altruism as the manifestation. But this is an incredible sense of rebirth. Let me talk and give you good news and bad news. I'm going to give you a theory of anti-Semitism for a couple minutes and talk about today for a couple minutes, then we'll take questions. 
If I want to encapsulate a long lecture on anti-Semitism, I want you to hear three, actually four words. Source, goal, priority, crisis. Anti-Semitism differs as to its source. Religious anti-Semitism, political anti-Semitism, social anti-Semitism, economic anti-Semitism, racial anti-Semitism. I can go on, but let's use those as categories. Anti-Semitism differs as to its goal. If you have religious anti-Semitism, what is the goal? Conversion. For Christians, a baptized Jew is what? Is a Christian. If you have social anti-Semitism, it essentially says, "Oh, the Groucho Marxist terms. I don't want. Uh, I don't want to be a member of a club that would have me as a member." In other terms, it means I don't want to have to socially. We used to have a term in America called five o'clock shadow. That people worked with each other, even well with each other. After five o'clock, they socialized with their own. It means you don't marry, you don't. Uh, and think of this. In, in, think of this. In, in let's use an example. We all uh, uh, can can understand. Imagine if Joe Kennedy's kids had brought home a Jew for marriage. Joe Kennedy's grandchildren and marriages. But none of his children would have what? Would have dared to bring home a Jewish bride or a Jewish groom. Right? Caroline Kenny is married to Schlossberg. Jackie Kenny ended up what the last man in her life was was a, a <coughs> Jew and a serious Jew and a philanthropic Jew. Right? Even uh, Robert Kennedy Jr. is married to a Jewish woman uh, with all the conspiracy theories and all of this stuff. Social anti-Semitism meant we don't socialize together, we don't belong to the same clubs. You all know how did the standard club in Chicago get formed? Jews weren't allowed in other clubs. That's so political anti-Semitism, we see the Jews shall not replace us. Now, economic anti-Semitism is also, uh, again, the idea, and, and you've got to understand this, what are the measurement tools we have, uh, what is economic anti-Semitism? We want to eliminate the role of Jews in the economy. And by the way, even if you're not an anti-Semite, you have to say something. Secretary of Treasury is a Jew. The previous Secretary of Treasury is a Jew. The previous Secretary of Treasury was not only a Jew, but an Orthodox Jew. The previous Secretary of Treasury was Jewish. The Secretary of Treasury before that was Jewish. Until Powell was appointed as Chairman of the Federal Reserve, Chairman of the Federal Reserve was Jewish. The Vice Chairman of the Federal Reserve was an Israeli Rhodesian American Jew. Chairman before that was a man by the name of Shalom Ben Bernanke. Vice, uh, the chairman before that was Alan Greenspan. So you will ask about Jews' control of the economy, which would be regarded as anti-Semitic, as for Jewish disproportionate influence on the economy, and even a non-anti-Semite would have to say what? It's there. What was unique about Nazism was, ra was racial anti-Semitism. Jews were defined by blood. And if the goal of blood, the only way to, and by the way, this is where Whoopi Goldberg sees racism in black, white, she doesn't understand that 1935, the Jews were defined on the basis of blood, which meant I just was in Warsaw. You know what the only building in the Warsaw Ghetto that was standing at the end of the Warsaw Ghetto after they had blown up the Warsaw Ghetto? The only building that was standing was a Roman Catholic church frequented by Roman Catholic parishioners serviced by Roman Catholic priests, all of whom were considered by the Nazi state to be Jews, by the Roman Catholics to be what? 
Catholics. It was all a matter of blood, and that meant, I, you know, I always say, and, and I work in all across bounds, I tell my ultra-Orthodox friends, I say, look, the Nazis didn't discriminate against Jews, they hated all of us. In a very peculiar way, equally. Because it was racial. What's the third term? The third term is priority. One of the reasons we are safe in America, have been safe in America, for a very long time is we've never been the number one victim group. Can't say that out loud too often, but that's the reason we are safest here. In Europe, the significant other was the Jew, the only one who is not a Christian. In the United States, other groups are higher priority, even with the resurgence of anti-Semitism today, we're not number one priority. I can document for you from 1919 onward, we were the number one priority for Hitler. His last words were, above all, I enjoined the German nation to what? Get rid of the Jews. The last written words we have from Adolf Hitler. What's the last segment of it is crisis. The axiom is the more stable a society is, the safer its Jewish community is. And one of the reasons for our resurgence of anti-Semitism is we've had a health crisis, which led to an economic crisis, we have a crisis of truth, we have a crisis of polarization, and we also have manufactured crisis. If you say we have a problem at the border, that's one thing. If you say we have an invasion at the border, it's something else. And the last two points is we have a, the biggest crisis we have now is the permissibility of the expression of hatred. And I'm not talking legal terms, but I'm talking that we all grew up in a time in which there may have been racism in America, but you kept your mouth shut about it. There may have been anti-Semitism in America, but you didn't say it. What do we have now? We have essentially two things that are absolutely pivotal. You have the megaphone of the internet and the social support networks of the social communities. For very little money, you can put out anything into the world that you want to put out and uh, you can find mutual support for all of that. And that's part of the reason we have a crisis. Now, genocide did not end with Auschwitz. Crimes against humanity did not end with Auschwitz. We're going to experiencing that today. We're experiencing genocide today. We're experiencing anti-Semitism today. But again, I don't want us to underestimate the power of the Jews to be able to grapple with this in a way. And also, at least for the most part, the support networks that we have from civil authorities. The most important thing we discovered after what the, the uh, Tree of Life thing is the community came together. The community came together to protect its neighborhood. Police chief was there, the district attorney was there, what? The uh, governor was there, the mayor was there. You had rabbis, priests, and even imams. All of them, what, saying, we don't want hatred in our midst. Solidarity of the anti-hatred community becomes an indispensable point. And what's the problem in our society is we now have all sorts of permissibility for the expression of hatred and rage. And that's why we're all feeling destabilized. And rightfully so, because we live in, in dangerous times. And people who don't want to even think of themselves as anti-Semitic are spreading all of the conspiracy theories of anti-Semitism. 
Let's take uh, examples. Since a Jew whose family was killed, whose grandparents were killed in Auschwitz, whose parents were in Auschwitz, developed the vaccine, the anti-vaxxers think Jews must have brought us COVID. Why would, why would one develop a vaccine? You have needed disease to create a vaccine in order for Pfizer or what? To make its millions of dollars, etc. You had uh, a lunatic congresswoman speak of, of the forest fires in California being done because the Rothschilds are what? Shooting lasers from the sky. Laugh but cry. Laugh but cry. We're not headed to Auschwitz. That doesn't mean it's safe. Let me just conclude by saying, um, uh, I'm going to conclude with a double edge. Prior to this last six months, I would say there are two elements, and it's only going to get worse. There are two elements, there are three elements that we have to think of. What's the difference between anti Semitism and legitimate criticism of Israel? Nathan Sharansky, Natan Sharansky, suggested a threefold. The three Ds. Double standards. If you judge Jews by one standard, everybody else by another, you're moving close to anti Semitism. Delegitimation. If you say, for example, Israel is established on territory that disrupted its native population, so is Canada, so is the United States, so is Australia, so are. 100, uh, are at least 26 countries, if therefore they have no right to exist, then the United States has no right to exist, Australia has no right to exist, um, Canada has no right to exist. And the last and most dangerous was demonization. And demonization meant that it, the sword, Jews is the source of all evil. We have code words for that. On the right, it's not quite an accident that the word Soros, 92-year-old man is guilty of doing everything imaginable, the Soros suggestion of all the things that he's involved with, the conspiracy involved in that. It's, and Israel ends up being, again, portrayed as the source of all evil. Word about the good news, um, and again, prior to the last several months where Israel now, we don't know what it's going to turn out to be. Uh, I can only tell you this, my sister is an, um, an ardent Zionist, she made Aliyah 50 years ago. And I can only judge by this that when we call, we speak, and we speak at least once or twice a week, the first 30 minutes are her uh, expressing her rage at what's happening to the country that she decided to. Only after about 30 minutes does she say, and how's the family? <laughs> and that's true of every one of my Israeli friends. So we don't know. All we can say is, as this moment develops, it's only going to get worse. Only going to get worse. So we don't know what, what the, the element is. The only, uh, there are three parts of good news, let me give them to you quickly. Number one, Christianity is far less anti-Semitic than it's ever been. I can tell it to you in Roman Catholicism, John, uh, Paul, uh, John the 23rd got rid of the accusation of Jews as Christ killer. John Paul II said anti-Semitism is anti-Christian. John II, uh, Paul II also what recognized the state of Israel. Francis got rid of the mission to the Jews. And that is enormously significant. We have a temporary alliance with the evangelicals until they get disappointed that Jesus has not returned. And I'm a believing enough Jew. Um, the easiest belief I have as a Jew is the Messiah has not yet come. And I don't think the Messiah is likely to come very quickly. 
If you want evidence of that, read the morning newspaper. The third thing is that we had in America, after the Pittsburgh incident, and we're having it more now, is the Muslim community is showing up and understanding that in America, civility has been the currency of interreligious relationship. Read an article in the New York Times today by a rabbi who said that to, uh, when they realized that Passover was going to end at the end of Ramadan, they ran a, the equivalent of Mamuna in Morocco. They used to have a, um, uh, a wonderful thing, which is on the eighth day of Passover, the uh, Arab community in Morocco used to bake bread, and at the end of Passover, they would serve bread, and they would have receptions and um, um, feasts for Jews who could not eat bread for eight days. And if it coincided with Ramadan, it was the end of Ramadan, so both of them with darkness could eat together. Um, that's what they did in one synagogue with their Turkish community. And the fact that you have the Abraham Accords, if they last, means that at least one segment is going to be less anti-Semitic. That's glimpses of goodness. The structure and the nature of the modern world and its potential for evil, especially as we move to the forefronts of technology, is not to be underestimated. And we have to make sure that Auschwitz is the past and its manifestations don't become our future. Let's take questions. Thank you. Have any questions? I want to just say um, that uh, I forgot to mention that this program is uh, brought to us by the um, Damsky Spansky um, uh, Fund here. So two of our founding families, and uh, they they left a generous bequest for great programs like this. So, but I'll open up the floor to questions for Dr. Berba. Let's start with um, share with us how Hitler initially looked at the United States and the Jim Crow laws. Hitler, Hitler let, let's begin. Um, Hitler viewed the United States with envy. He viewed the United States with envy. First of all, he liked the idea that we went from sea to shiny sea. And if you think of Germany, Germany is the center of Europe, but it's locked in by all the other countries of Europe. And its expansionism essentially was designed to move it out and give it breath. The German treatment of the, uh, I'm going to use non-PC terms, but I can't, uh, I'm a historian, so I have to use Nazi terms instead of speaking of Germans of special needs. Germans um, began a lot of their work, in fact, the gas chambers were begun not for the murder of Jews, it was begun for the murder of Germans who were regarded as an embarrassment to the myth of our German non-Jews regarded as an embarrassment to the myth of Aaron's supremacy, mentally retarded, physically infirm, emotionally distraught, congenitally ill. Uh, Germans, how do you have a master race? And I'm going to put it in, again, non-PC terms, how do you have a master race and a retarded child? It's an embarrassment, therefore, that's... He also looked at Jim Crow laws, and uh, again, if... I were building a museum in the American South, I would have a Jim Crow example f only for coloreds and only, and only for whites, and the parallels nor for Juden, et cetera, et cetera, in that. And if you go to South Africa and you look at that, you see the way in which the South Africans present the discrimination uh, against Jews as an outgrowth, as parallel or echoed in the apartheid. So America became that example to Hitler. And the other half of it, though, is he did not like the Jewish influence in America. Uh, let me tell you a, a good, um, uh, a humorous way of putting it. 
uh, and I always use humor. As, I use humor that uh, that outgrowth from the Holocaust to show how Jews sometimes responded to their own condition with the ironic sense of, of humor. Two Jews are sitting, and uh, one is reading their Sturmer, which is the Nazi thing, and the other is reading a Jewish newspaper. Moshe and Yankov. Moshe, how can you read that garbage? He's shocked immediately. Yankov says, and how can you read that garbage? He says, what do you mean? He says, you read the Jewish newspaper, and what do you hear? You hear that the situation is terrible. It's going to be worse tomorrow and even worse the day after. That the following decrees have gone, the following restrictions, and the like. I read Der Sturmer, and I realize that Roosevelt is not Roosevelt. It's Rosenfeld. Franklin Delano Rosenfeld, that we control the entire world, that we have all this enormous wealth. Why would I read your newspaper when I can read my newspaper? which is a way of saying the danger of alternate facts. So America became, on the one hand, a model, and on the other hand, the suspicion that Jews controlled America. And if I told you the one element that Jews, just because Jews were passive does not, just because Jews were powerless does not mean they were passive. Let me give you another one-liner that you have to hear. Jews have never been as powerful as our enemies have accused us of being, and never as powerless with the exception of the Holocaust as we actually, what, sometimes feel ourselves to be. We've always wrestled between what power, uh, power and powerlessness. We've had to walk the narrow ridge in order to survive. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. The, the racial divisions in America are, the racial and the anti-immigrant divisions in America um, are licensed to, in, to increase the expression of hatred. Uh, and it's infectious. I mean, look at last, last week, you also have the infectiousness of, of, of people who are wantonly shooting. <coughs> I mean, a, a, a kid knocks at the door, the wrong door, and he's shot. Uh, another uh, girl, right, the uh, 16-year-old uh, girl, I mean, I can still use girl, I don't have to use woman on that. 16-year-old girl pulls into the wrong driveway and somebody comes out and shoots her. I have a 21-year-old daughter living right near there. You know, I read that and I cringed. I don't know that my kid, if she's out in the country, is going to turn into the right driveway. She's got her own car. And I told her, you better, I, I called her and I, I, imagine what it's like to talk to your kid. Every, every parent has, uh, look, we had this, uh, you had this when uh, Obama said, um, when Henry Louis Gates was arrested breaking into his own home. And Obama said, that could have happened to me. You have it when, uh, imagine the talk when, uh, we all panic when our kids get their driver's license. In fact, I believe that the bar mitzvah should coincide with the kid getting the driver's license because 13-year-olds really aren't. Even though we count them in a minion, they're not adults yet. But when they get the driver's license, they really are what? They're, they're on their own. Imagine what it's like to be a black parent having to talk to your, in particular to your sons about this. You get stopped, you put your hands up, you don't move anywhere, you just, you know, yes sir, no sir, etc., etc. So we have a proliferation of hatred in our society. And by the way, that's the extreme right, or that's the right. We also have problems on the left. But it's, it's at this moment, we also have something on, on the right that um, the, the yearning for a Christian nationalism of an American, uh, an American Christian society, they have, there's a problem. 
Since the 1960s, WAS domination of American society has been overthrown. Let's, let's be very candid. 1960s, we began to include in the civil rights movement, we began to give equal rights to blacks, and there's been a diminishment of WAS power. Tremendous diminishment of WAS power. We can see it, and, and Jews were equipped to move into that diminishment of power. We were economically equipped to move into neighborhoods that would never have us before. We are economically equipped, intellectually equipped to move into knowledge areas, et cetera, et cetera. So um, all of this hatred then goes to, goes to back to core hatreds. Now, let me give you one more piece of good news. Some of you will remember back to the oil crisis after the 73 war and after the Iranian uh, Ayatollah Khomeini takeover. We thought that power was going to be in the control of natural resources. What's been the story of the last 20 years uh, of the 20th century and the first 25 years, 23 years of the 21st century? Power is in the ability to handle knowledge. Right? Power is in the ability to handle knowledge. What does Michael Bloomberg offer? Literally only offers the capacity to use the resources of the internet to put it on your desk that you're willing to pay eighty to hundred thousand dollars a year for the information that he provides. And he becomes one of the wealthiest men in the world. What does Bill Gates provide? The unleashing of the power of the computer. Apple makes it sexy, but Microsoft makes it what? Makes it um, uh, unleashing of that power. Knowledge-based economy. This is, again, what we're seeing in Israel. Why did Israel prosper? The joke when I was a kid is, how do you make a big fortune in Israel? You come with a small fortune. Uh, how do you make a, a small fortune in Israel? You come with a big fortune. And now Israel became what called itself startup nation. And one of the challenges, one of the economic tensions in Israel is whether it's knowledge in the technological sphere and the whole technology thing, or whether it's going to be Torah knowledge without, with exclusion of it, and whether in schools they're going to teach, in the Orthodox schools, they're going to teach what? They're going to teach science and math. But my nephews and my great nephews who live in Israel are all looking what? In the technological sector and the, the, the job is booming, but they're equipped for that. that and why, why do the Arabs want to make peace in one sense with Israel is because they understand that the energy sources they have are a depleting resource. The knowledge sources are never depleting if you what? Maintain your education. When the Israelis go on, when the education system goes on strike in Israel, it should be a military emergency, right? When we have a challenge as to how we're educating our kids, that's the essence of that what? We have this in, in, a, in a very mundane thing. I'll tell you a, a story. A member of my synagogue who was born in Libya as the awkward son of a Muslim peasant family, was educated when, when uh, Gaddafi wanted to, did it, excelled in, in, um, excelled in uh, his educational studies. They sent him to the University of Michigan to get his PhD in physics. Came to the United States, got his PhD in physics, stayed in the United States. So we have to thank Gaddafi for this. Ended up marrying a Jewish woman, becoming a Jew. The brain drain, if you see that they want to eliminate foreign students, the brain seepage to the United States of foreign students has been one of the masterful secrets of success. The best and the brightest want to come here to study if we what? maintain the standards of our universities 
and, and all of that. And knowledge is the source of power at this moment. And it's been one of the, one of the ways in which uh, the Jewish community has excelled and one of the ways in which Israel transformed itself from what? An agricultural society where the kibbutz was the model into the high tech society, which is global. Now, what's the problem with the government at this moment is the high tech society has said, if you don't have X, Y, and Z types of guarantees, we'll take our technology elsewhere. And I'll give you a, a physical example of that. Los Angeles is the second largest Jewish community in America. The direct flights of United Airlines uh, from Israel go to San Francisco. Why San Francisco? Because it's next to Silicon Valley. I can't get a direct flight on United Airlines from Los Angeles. I can get a direct flight every night. And not only that, I can leave Israel at 1 o'clock in the morning and be at my desk in Silicon Valley at 8 o'clock in the morning. You have to wait. You land at 5 o'clock. The customs don't know, does not open till 6 o'clock. You can be at your desk at 8 o'clock in the morning. The mutual uh, absorption of that. Other questions? Rabbi. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much for your time. Um, so we had a meeting today with um, parents of teenagers and uh, one, uh, a couple of teenagers as well and with the representative from the ADL. And we're talking about anti-Semitism in the public schools. And what comes up is often the pain points for our high school students is when the Holocaust is taught. That is when the kids get bullied. That is when all of the most obnoxious things are said. At that very moment, how ironic it is that that brings up all this hatred towards Jews. And I, I just wonder if your comment on um, Holocaust education today, because many modern critics of it say that it no longer shocks people. In the, it, 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 people have kind of seen Jews as, well, dead and dehumanized and bodies. They don't know real Jews. And there's not a sense of empathy. And, and there's not a connection to the um, kind of the root causes, blaming someone for your problem. Um, what do you I, do? First of all, I thank you for yes. the I thank you for the question. I'll give you your uh, I'll give you your your, your cut of my honorarium for asking that question. <laughs> great, great, great question. Very important question. Um, there, is, there is what one of the reasons that the Holocaust becomes a source of bullying is because the the Holocaust sometimes is taught. And there's a phrase of this um, in the book of, of, um, of uh, Lamentations in Megillat Eshter. Rei Hashem v'abitam yesh machol k'machol v'yal shever batami. Lord, look at us and see if there has ever been a pain like my pain uh, on the destruction of my people. You can't have a, what we call the Olympics of suffering. Suffering is personal. If you have a toothache, it doesn't, ha it doesn't help you if I say I have a stomachache. It helps you if I say I understand your pain because I once had a toothache as well. And can I help you deal with it? Some of the treatment of the Holocaust is we've said there is nothing like this, nothing, the uniqueness and the exclusionary. I, I fought when we created the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum over the issue whether, um, whether the Holocaust was comparable. People made, a, made a, a mistake because they thought if we included other sufferings, we were equating the Holocaust with other sufferings. And I came from uh, a teacher's perspective that you compare and contrast that in comparison and contrast, you understand what's distinct about it and what's not, what it shares in common. If the Holocaust is a suffering unlike any, and, and even great people had this, you know, that word, Elie Wiesel used to say, that world is not our world. 
Well, the problem is if that world is not our world, then it has nothing to say to our world. And my work has been to show that it has something to say to our world, which makes us more sensitive to other forms of suffering. There is a, a, one of the, the questions becomes whether it's a special pleading or it's an understanding of the structure of evil, the nature of evil, which sheds light on other forms of hatred, other forms of racism, other forms of slavery, other forms of genocide, or you say, I alone suffered, look at me, I'm, I'm, I'm the worst. One of the great, uh, my friend Margot Strom, who was the creator of Facing History, created an incredible curriculum that um, is used in schools all over the world now, which puts the Holocaust as a signpost to explore the issues. Now, let's look at, at, at one of the issues. And I, I'm, I'm going to be a, a drop political, but I don't, don't want to be, but I'm, I'm going to have. If you can't confront your own history, and we have people who want to exclude the confrontation of our history, America had a dark history. It's not the only chapter of our history. But we benefited enormously from slavery. By the way, before most of the Jews came, ever came here. But if we can't confront that, then we can't understand the origin of America and its role. We also can't understand the difference between the African American experience and everybody else's experience. Everybody else came to America for opportunity and freedom. They came in chains and in slavery. And even today, when you talk about the quotation marks migration from Central and, and South America, why are they coming to America? They're coming for opportunity and for freedom because there's, their own situation is catastrophic radically different than the African-American experience. You have to be able to confront your own past. You're a rabbi and you understand that one of the things that Judaism says is that the only way to move forward is by what? Confession? It is by recognizing what you've done wrong, by confessing to it, and by doing better the next time. Right? Otherwise you wouldn't have Yom Kippur. Right? We have to confront that. So obviously if the Holocaust is taught as an exclusionary form of education, it's destructive. If it's taught as an inclusionary form that reaches out to others, then it does an important, an important point. And also it depends, and, and let me give you one more example. Let's take the example of Angela Merkel. Forty years ago, or uh, it's now, uh, yeah, it's 40 years ago, Helmut Kohl wanted to normalize Germany and get rid of the memory of the Holocaust. That's what the, that ultimately led to the crisis of Bitburg. Angela Merkel look back and says, we have to confront that past because that's not what we want to be. I want to define myself as the anti-Nazi, as democratic, as what? Protector of human rights, human dignity. Her support for Jews in Israel was not out of love of Jews in Israel as much as it was out of hatred of what Nazism represented and what it did to the German people, and that was a much more genuine experience. So if America confronts it past and says, we once had slavery, therefore we are anti-slavery. We once treated uh, uh, Native Americans as non-people and African uh, and, and blacks uh, as, what, three-fifths of a person. That's why we're going to treat everybody as 100% of a person, right? And we're going to begin to think not all men are created equal, but all people are created equal, including women. I mean, all of this is a way in which you confront your past to what? Improve your future. 
And that becomes a very useful form of Holocaust education if it's done right. But it has to be done right. And sometimes it can alienate and sometimes it cannot. Now, you also have to have the problem that, that let me give you, January 6th, you had a guy in there who said Auschwitz staff. Now, the good news is he wasn't denying the Holocaust. He merely wanted to repeat it. So we've gotten beyond, uh, you also have a, a sweatshirt available on the internet, 6MWE. Six million wasn't enough. Uh, this is available to, uh, available to purchase. You have it in all of the sizes you want. You can get a big one, a little one, you know, all of that. So there are people who want to replicate this. Um, and and uh, you also see it, uh, I, I was with a, a physician yesterday who tells, tells a story. His nurses are going to put the IV in, and they call him over, and the guy has a swastika tattooed on his right arm. She looks and he says, well, why don't you try the left arm? And then he's got two swastikas on the left arm. So his nurse is uh, Jewish, and he says, put the IV in. And um, his anesthesiologist is Jewish. His uh, intern who's interning is Jewish. He's Jewish. And they're looking at each other, and he says, we're going to do this by the book 100%. But when he wakes up, we're going to tell him that the people who saved his life were all Jews. <laughs> now, I'm worried about one thing with high school kids, and this scares the daylights out of me. I'm worried that they're going to internalize the stigma of being Jewish. One of the things we've done in the last generation is a pride in being Jewish. You see it in a very basic thing. People wore Jewish stars as necklaces. So a generation ago, they were stigmatizing us with, with, with yellow stars, and now we wear it as beautiful jewelry. I'm scared that kids are going to say, and there's an example in Kurt Flood's baseball film of, of a, 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 I'm going to use the, the term that he used at that point, Negro ball player in 46 who tried to take off his black skin. He wanted so badly to play in the major league, he hated his skin, he wanted to pull it off. And Kurt Flood, who integrated, not only integrated baseball, but beat the baseball reserve clause, has a great line in Ken Burns' series. He says, I never objected to having a black skin. I just wish I had a thicker one. So I want Jews at this point, and we've got to teach our kids, you can't internalize it. Anti-Semitism is their problem, not my problem. And the second thing is you, can't, you, you have to have a pride in that, and you've got to have a certain thick skin. And I like Jews who have a certain type of thick skin and can take it. But obviously, if it's not taught well, look, I, I, let me give you one final example. Um, I've been speaking for the last seven years in a place called Minnetonka, Minnesota. I was giving a series of lectures on the Holocaust that ended up being half a book. Um, when they had a terrible incident in Minnetonka, which is somebody came to a Sadie Hawkins dance and dressed as Adolf Hitler with his date being dressed as Eva Braun. And it then be, went viral, and everybody was pointing to the high school that Minnetonka as being a place of hatred and whatever have you. So I'm giving lectures on the Holocaust, I'm giving an academic thing, I've been preparing a book, I've gotten, you know, time to prepare the book, and they say, would you speak to the high school men talk? I said, well, it's easy to lecture to you. It's harder to lecture to high school, to college kids. It's much harder to yell lecture to high school kids. 
it's delightful to lecture to, to teach little kids, but high school kids, you really got to work. So I didn't know what the hell I was going to say. But I came in and I said, look, you guys don't want to hear from me. But I'll tell you one thing. This high school can get a reputation as the place where racism flourishes, or the place that, has, that gets a reputation as the place that has come to terms with racism and expelled it from its, from its walls. If you do that, you'll have a wonderful series of college essays for admission to college, and Minnetonka will be, will be known as a hell of a school. If that's what you want to do, I'm here to help you. If you don't want to do that, then don't listen to me. I have nothing to say to you. But if you want to turn that around and say, we don't want that in our midst, I'll give you a thousand ways in which I can help you. And that's the speech. It's one, it's one sentence speech that I've been giving for the last many, many years in Minnetonka. And uh, I then I speak to what's called the rising seniors. I speak to the junior class right before that. Your leaders in school. This is what happened in this school. Let's talk about how the hell you create a different atmosphere. And like that should be what we address when we get to high school. And the resources are not to lecture the kids, but to say, you got a choice. You want to go down this path, you go down this path, and you know, I have nothing to say to you. You don't need me, and, and you can do it yourself. You can hate like hell. If you want to work with us, then let's, let's do that. Let's address it. And apparently, uh, it's been very helpful to them because they keep inviting me back. And I give exactly the same speech every year. And it works. And, and by the way, and they now have me doing something else. They have me talking to the parents the night before. What type of kids do you want to create? And this is a community, by the way, that has Sudanese, that has a whole range of, of people. What type of kids do you want to create? What do you want your kids to go out into the world with? And again, it's a, you, you've got to find a way to turn it around and also to empower people not to hate. And if you do that, then we live in a little bit of a better world. We're going to take a couple more questions, and then I have a principle that for an event to become uh, immortal, it doesn't have to be eternal. <laughs> yes? Um. Sometimes when I when I, I read what's going on in this, in this country and I, I look online and read the newspapers and whatever, I can't help but wonder if we're not living at the end of uh, a 70-year golden golden period for American Jewry. Um, I, I wonder. I, I wonder exactly the same thing. Okay. We had look. I wonder also if we're not living at the end of the American century. Yeah, but we're talking about Jews today. I mean, <laughs> I mean that's that, that we we. Uh, I'll put it to you a different way. One of the reasons that Jews have survived for millennia is the capacity to migrate. Remember, Jews came to America in, from 18, Jews population for the large part came to America from 1881 to 1924. They came here and they were participants in the golden century of the United States of America. I don't want to say we were its authors, we were participants in it. I despair of the fact that we can't seem to come together. I despair of our leadership, or a lack of leadership. I can be candid, I was not certain that I would continue to live in America if Trump had a second term. And worse than that, I didn't know where I would go. And I would, you know, I, I had, I, I, I'm in a very fortunate position, I can live anywhere near an airport and uh, we kidded about that. Uh, I've, I, I 
have good friends in Australia, but I find Australia boring. <laughs> what can I say? <laughs> it's, too be it's too beautiful, it's too nice, it's too, com too comfortable, etc., etc. You know, so I was, I, I was saying, I, I, can go to, I can go to Australia, I can go to Canada. Uh, uh, I wasn't fully contemplating going to Israel, even though I, you know, I speak the language fluently and like, but uh, uh, the, the question is, where do, where do I go? I, I despair of that. I think that, that we're in a very painful moment in American society. We have not been addressing some of our fundamental problems. And we don't seem to be able to come together. I lived in Washington, D.C. And um, our home could have Democrats and Republicans to dinner. And we got along very well. My mentor in Washington was the former deputy um, head of the CIA. And I was a child of Vietnam. If I would tell you what I thought of the CIA during Vietnam, there weren't words and I couldn't say them in a synagogue. His son was the chief of staff to George W. Bush. He's the equivalent of a member of my family. I was in a bizarre situation of my call would be returned within an hour from the chief of staff of the President of the United States. And I'm an ardent Democrat and he's an ardent Republican. But we're brothers. He's wrong about everything, but we're brothers. <laughs> but today, and he's not like that, today we'd have to be considered enemies. That's not the way it should be. He has a different view of how to solve certain problems. I have a different view of how to solve certain problems. Different view of responsibility, et cetera, et cetera. We are in a, the, the genius of America w used to be that we played the political game within the 20 yard lines. Nobody was deep in the other guy's end zone. And that's, and, and you know, that, that's what they, that's what they call, used to call rhinos. We didn't go to the extremes. You had the John Birch Society, but the John Birch Society became what excluded. You had a whole range, you had the communists after Stalin, the communists became what? Pushed aside in one sense. We played the political game within a certain type of vicinity, and that was good. Last question, sir. So, um, you said so many interesting things, and I've been down to that list recently, I want to bring up. Um, but I think I'll follow up with this at the end, just because we're talking about education. Would you be able to speak in Florida, or in Mississippi, or Alabama now? Because they put in laws that don't allow you to upset somebody if you go to the school. Look, I, I just wrote about that. Education is about upsetting people. You don't have to argue with me. No, no, I'm, I'm just saying, I'm just saying, uh, uh, ideas should be upsetting. Socrates upset people. Jesus upset people. Right? Great ideas should upset people. Part of part of of this type of part of this type of thing is, is to close off some of the great notions. I want. I I believe, by the way, that teaching is not to upset people for the purpose of upsetting, but it's to open them up to brand new ideas that reshape their own views of the world. And that's the essence of good teaching. Let me give you a, 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 my philosophy of teaching in a very particular way. If you become excited about me, that means I'm a performer. If you become excited about you, that means you're a social, that I'm a social worker. If you become excited about what you're studying, that means I'm a teacher. And we have to be able to challenge people, challenge ideas, and, and, and allow people to grow. 
and, and by the way, and we have to be challenged by our students. I, I tell you, tell you, my most important experience of teaching, which had nothing to do with me. 1984, um, I, teach the, I taught the Holocaust at Georgetown. And I used to assign survivor's testimony, which was just becoming tech. I would hand out, uh, in those days, it was um, a VHSs. Remember, remember VHSs? I would hand it out to students, and I would say, I want you to play this, and I want you, whenever your, your survivor's testimony comes into the class, I want you to pipe up and say, this is what happened to my man, woman, person, child, etc., etc." Young woman comes into my office and says, can I tell my story? I, like a dum-dum, says, what's your story? Her story is she was a survivor of the Cambodian genocide. Of course she can tell your story. Well, she started telling her story, and it took six classes. Curriculum went out the, went out the window, but the kids got a real education. And a guy comes into my office and says, my God, I was about to ask her out on a date. And who knew this backstory? And now I'm scared. I said, well, she's a lovely woman. Why don't you ask her out on a date and deal with your own fright and grow for the occasion? Ten years later, I'm in Rwanda. I'm advising the government on Rwanda how to document the genocide that's just taken place. I walk Kigali, this is months after the genocide, maybe two, three months after the genocide. I walk Kigali, and I come to a place that's absolutely silent. And I say to myself that danger is cultural, meaning you have to be able to pick up the vibes of danger. Why is this silent? There's not a cat, there's not a dog, there's not a honking, a honking horn. There's not a light on, there's not a noise, there's nobody slamming a door. I may be in the middle of something that's profoundly dangerous, so I do the only honorable thing a person could do at that point, which is I jog back to my hotel as fast as I can. I don't want to provoke that. Walk into my hotel, I'm sweating profusely. A lovely blonde woman walks up to me and hugs me. Doesn't happen often, doesn't happen often. <laughs> doesn't happen often, doesn't happen often enough. I look at her, she looks eerily familiar. She then identifies herself. And she was a doctor without, a, a doctor who was there with doctors without borders. She was a product of my 1984 class. She said, when the genocide took place, I had a choice. I could go out with the Marines or I could stay here and be a doctor. She said, I decided to stay and be a doctor because of what not what you taught me, she didn't say it. she was more polite than that. Not because of what I taught her, but because of what she heard from her classmate. Said, I want you to do me one favor, and I was about to say from the book of Exodus, half of my kingdom, and it's yours, whatever you want me to do. I want you to go back and go visit my parents, tell them why I stayed. Because they want to kill me. Why didn't I go out when the American government says Americans get out of there? Why I expose myself, they invested a fortune in my medical education. I'm sitting here in, in Rwanda earning nothing to pay my student loans back and, and working with these doctors without borders. Her world was transformed by ideas and events that were upsetting. She saw a kid her age, her classmate, who had this backstory. Education's got to shake you up. Look, I have a, my, my son graduated from college in the middle, in the middle of uh, COVID, and I said, you know, you pay a bloody fortune to kid go to college. He, he did brilliantly in college, but he didn't do two things. That, he didn't do the three things that, that you need to do in college. You need to fall in love with a professor. You need to fall in love with a fellow student. You need to fall in love with an idea. And that's got to shake you and transform you. Thank you very much. There's some uh, staff, and, and please, um, I mean, we can continue more informal conversations. Thank you for coming. Well, now we know how we all
talk about us, right? <laughs> I have he's got pretty much right about us. <laughs> I haven't been, so I can't do that. Set my kid there. It's looking more and more appealing to me all the time. The boring was not. Yes, boring would be fine. Yeah. Unless there's some loose grain that doesn't I don't know. It's like <laughs> some <laughs> Maybe stronger than <laughs> has a very strange accent. She grew up speaking Yiddish. I mean, yeah. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> 
some names. Uh, let me ask Ron if he has some names he can share with you. After that, it's really up to I don't know if they'll be helpful or not, but at least a name. At least a name. Exactly. 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 You know, because I reached out to Ron Perlman, so she took a picture, so they have a But in some regards, I guess the main Thank you. 